Welcome. It's 12 o'clock and I think it's time for us to get started. I am Julene Smith and I'd like to welcome you to the Food for Thought event. I am the chair, board chair of Fair Start and it's indeed my honor to be here today to moderate the panel discussion that we're going to have around one of the most critical areas facing our communities today and that is food security. Now, before we get started and to really help center equity in our work and conversations, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are on the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish peoples and specifically stand on the lands of the first peoples of Seattle, the Duwamish. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish peoples who have stewarded past and present. I wanna thank you all for being with us today. And today our goal is to make this an informal but informative conversation about the work being done locally to address hunger and food insecurity. If you have questions, please put them in the chat and we're gonna do our best to respond to as many of those questions as we can towards the end of the event. Now, I know that each of us individually have been impacted by this COVID-19 crisis. And that crisis has created a second pandemic and that is hunger. More people are experiencing food insecurity for the first time while there are tens of thousands who persistently suffer from a lack of nutrition. In the state of Washington, roughly 30% of households are at risk of going hungry with children being in 59% of those homes. Now I wanna help ground us in what we mean when we talk about food security. So I'm gonna define it for us. Food security is when people have consistent access to safe and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences for a healthy life. And the decrease in food security this past year has caused nonprofit organizations to step up in new ways to keep people safe and to ensure that our neighbors don't go hungry. Today, we are privileged to hear from Gloria Hatcher Mays, who's the Executive Director of the Rainier Valley Food Bank, as well as Nicole Lowell, who is the Hunger Program Executive of the YMCA, and Angela Dunleavy, the CEO of Fair Start. No, Rainier Valley Food Bank and the YMCA have been on the front lines of hunger relief for a long time and Fair Start is honored to partner with them with its own food security work. So I wanna just take this time to thank you, Gloria, Nicole and Angela for joining us today. And before we dive into the questions, um, I wanted to give each of you an opportunity to tell us a little bit of something about yourself and your organization. So Gloria, I'm going to toss it to you to start off, uh, followed by Nicole and then Angela. So Gloria, please take it away. If you could take maybe one to two minutes and just tell us a little bit of something about yourself and your organization. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Fair Start is a terrific partner for us. Um, as uh, you mentioned, uh, I am the executive director for the Rainier Valley Food Bank. And our food bank has the highest volume of food distri distributed into the community of any of the food banks in the system that we call the Seattle Food Committee, which is a conglomerate of roughly 27 agencies that do the work around food insecurity uh, on behalf of the city of Seattle. And our clientele are primarily people of color, uh, folks that are low income or the working poor, and they skew toward being elderly. So a lot of old, uh, the older population uh, finds its way to visit our, our, our door. We're really, really proud of the work we do at the Rainier Valley Food Bank because we believe that we should be serving the entire uh, household, the whole family. So even our backpack program, does not send home a backpack full of goodies just for 
one child, we pack a whole bag of groceries to send home with that child to make sure that everybody in the household is fed over the course of the weekend. Uh, we are so very happy to have uh, partners like Food Lifeline in this work with us. We do a distribution every week at the Rainier Beach Community Center that averages 1,400 cars coming through our, our drive through site. Uh, so this pandemic has really been um, demonstrated where the cracks are in terms of the safety net in our community. And it really does revolve around food and food security. And it's one of the first areas that people started to feel pain when they lost their jobs due to COVID. So we're really happy to be in this work uh, in partnership with Fair Start and the other folks on the call. And I look forward to talking with you further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gloria, and thank you for the work that you're doing to serve our neighbors. Um, Nicole, I'll toss it to you. Yeah, thanks, Julaine. Hi, everyone. I am excited to be here. My name is Nicole Lau with the YMCA of Greater Seattle, um, and I oversee our hunger programming work, which actually not a lot of folks know about, so we are definitely... Um, some somewhat of a hidden program within our YMCA. However, we're trying to make sure that more um, people are aware of the work that we're doing outside in the communities that we serve. Um, Y'all might know YMCA as um, the 13 branches that we have across King County serving folks um, in all of King County and South Snohomish County as well. And we do youth development programming, we do social services, and we do healthy living. And so we have a lot of programs under each of those um, areas. And one thing of note for our hunger programs that we love is that it hits every single one of those areas. And so we're able to serve youth and much to um, the same sentiment that Gloria talked about, making sure that we're serving that whole family in addition to the youth. So providing nutritious meals um, after the school day, before the school day, during the pandemic whenever it's needed, um, but then also ensuring that the um, adults in that household, their parents, their guardians, um, whomever may live with them also has access to healthy, nutritious food. Um, and then also we're moving forward with healthy living to ensure and with Fair Start by our side to ensure that folks have gained access to that healthy, nutritious food that they want. Um, so I think it's been a really great partnership for us with Fair Start to look at menus and see how we can best support our communities um, through healthy food access. So I'm really excited to be here, share some of our learnings, and um, hear a lot about everybody else's as well. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, Angela? Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, I'm going to be brief because I think a lot of folks on this call no fair start, but I just really want to thank uh, Gloria and Nicole and your organizations for being such great partners. Um, for many of you on the call, you have long known our work. Um, our mission at Fair Start is to transform lives, disrupt poverty, and nourish communities through food, life skills, and job training. And prior to the COVID pandemic, I think that really um, externally facing in the community, people um, really um, uh, saw that job training and, and uh, the applied learning through our restaurants and catering and cafes much more than they saw the food security work. Um, a little bit to Nicole's point about the YMCA, we've actually been partnering with the YMCA for many years on school lunch uh, uh, programs during the summer. And actually Fair Start was founded uh, nearly 30 years ago through um, food security delivery um, and then added on that job training. So throughout the pandemic, and really, I think, not only throughout the COVID pandemic, but really tapping into the racial justice and race equity work that we began at Fair Start in 2018, it's really led us to um, uh, reevaluate how we're showing up in the community and delivering uh, food, um, food relief, food security, um, and where we show up and, and on whose tables we're uh, providing meals. And then um, we can talk um, uh, later if we have time about how we then plan in the post-COVID uh, world to incorporate job training into that. So it's again been such a wild year. Fair Start has been able to provide um, over 2.5 million meals around um, King County. Uh, Catalyst Kitchens um, are national um, through our national partners of Catalyst Kitchens. The collective network has provided over 18 million meals um, around the country. So this work, I think, has really evolved into having a lot of deep meaning to us. So excited for this conversation. 
Excellent. Thank you, Angela. Um, okay, so this is really going to be an informal and informative conversation. Uh, and so I'm going to ask questions and I just um, uh, welcome each of you panelists to respond to the questions as we have a dialogue around uh, these areas that we are interested in learning more about. The first question I want to ask um, is how has the pandemic impacted the need? Now, we, we know that the food security issue has just been exacerbated by this pandemic, but can you speak specifically to some of the things that you've seen in your organizations uh, in, in terms of the impact the pandemic has had on the need? And then how specifically did your organization respond? Um, I'd like well, to go first, okay. Gloria. Thank you. Yeah, I'll go ahead and go first. Um, one of the things that we, we noted right away is that there were some things happening surrounding our ability to make food accessible for folks because of the pandemic. Ordinarily, we have folks come in and shop, but as you know, uh, the, the orders from the governor were to stay home and shelter in place. And the folks that would travel to get to us would come on public transportation. So there were a lot of safety concerns that we had to address right away just to handle the uh, provision of food items to the people who normally came to see us. Um, and so we instantly shifted to a different type of model. We shifted to doing all home delivery so people could stay home and stay safe and still have access to food. Um, and then we noticed how large our waiting list was getting. Uh, we expanded our home delivery program. We started uh, at 300 before the pandemic, and now we are doing home delivery to over 1,600 households every week. That's in addition to the drive-through service that we do down at Rainier Beach Community Center every Wednesday, which provides uh, over 1,400 households worth of food um, by drive-through in cars. So we've seen a significant and dramatic increase in the amount of households that we, we serve. It always makes us very happy when someone calls and says, we no longer need to stay on your home delivery list, but we really appreciated the service that you offered to us. It doesn't have to happen often. Um, and we are very concerned that this uh, pandemic, the impact of the pandemic is gonna have a very long-term effect as it takes a long time for people to rejoin the economy after losing their jobs. Thank you, Gloria. Anyone else want to respond? We're talking about how your organization responded to the pandemic and the impact that you've seen. Nicole? Um, I can respond. I think, um, you know, when the pandemic first hit, we kind of looked at two different areas, what impacted our communities. One was um, folks who were already in food insecurity, um, areas in their life. And so, and then also folks who were then being kind of catapulted into um, foods insecurity that had never accessed assistance before. And so mm -hmm. two areas that we um, noticed at the very beginning of the pandemic. And then like Gloria was talking about the safety and access and breaking down barriers to ensure that our community felt safe to gain access to healthy quality food. Um, and so, you know, we talked a little bit about food insecurity rates um, and about how they're continuing to rise and that needs not going away. I completely agree with Gloria. It's gonna be here for some time, unfortunately. Um, and if we look back at the Great Recession, um, which was financially destructive, but not nearly as much as the pandemic that we're facing right now, it took us about a decade to start to come back and see food insecurity numbers decrease so that just kind of gives us a little bit of a lens of how long we might be in this. Um, and so I think, you know, when, when it happened, uh, the YMCA of Greater Seattle responded with three focus areas. We had food security, we had childcare and housing and mental health supports. Um, and so specific for our, our food security, um, we worked with partners across the county to identify gaps and resources. And so if there was a gap in a community, we would work with different partners to identify what was the best resource to help uplift that community, ensure that they got food access. 
Um, and then we also um, identified what are the barriers and what are the solutions that we can put in place to ensure that communities do have access to those food uh, programming. And so our particular programs working with Fair Start, we did um, youth meals, we did home delivery, like Gloria had said as well, we offered grab and go. Um, and we did it quickly within 24 hours so that way communities weren't missing a meal, um, which was a really big piece of our response and really great that Fair Start and other partners were able to work so quickly with us. Um, and we focused our efforts in particular areas like South King County and East King County where the resources or the need in South King County, the need is the greatest. Um, and so multiple resources were needed. And then in East King County, there were less resources. And so there's just gaps in services. Um, mm -hmm. We were able to expand our hunger programs to serve people in unique ways. And we were able to actually increase um, over 56% um, in 2020 of the meals served and just expand those programs. So pre-pandemic, we were serving about 2,500 kiddos. And then post pandemic, we're a week. Um, and then post or during the pandemic, we've been serving about 10,000 meals a week. Wow. wow. Thank you, Nicole. Angela, you want to share a little yeah. bit about your story? Yeah. You know, I think I would just sort of bring um, the connection of Fair Start to this in some of our learnings. As um, you all know, we pivoted very quickly, uh, transforming our restaurants and catering kitchens. Um, and existing community meals kitchens into really answering um, the needs of this pandemic. And what we learned in this was really interesting um, around access to food and access to prepared meals. So we saw, um, Gloria alluded to um, sort of the bottleneck that happened at the beginning of the pandemic with um, uh, the governor's orders. And there ended up being a big bottleneck in the supply chain where we had all of these large format items and um, fresh ingredient items that were no longer be, being able to be stocked in the same way that they were in the food banks. And so what Fair Start was able to do was collect some of that, recover some of that food before it was wasted and turn it into nutritious meals. I think that the other thing that we learned through that was that while individuals were recovering from COVID, while families were struggling to educate their children and maybe you know work one, two, three jobs as essential workers, that this equity, um, that we had an equity access point for a prepared meal option, which we're now doing through the food bank, which we've been doing with the YMCA for quite some time, to give families a prepared meal that maybe if someone in the family was sick would be very easy for them to reheat, whether if they didn't have access to proper kitchen um, facilities that would be easier for them to reheat. And then frankly, just from an equity perspective, I think that, you know, many of us on the call breathe that sigh of relief on that, you know, one night of the week or one night of the month uh, that we do take out for our families and we don't have to worry about cooking and cleaning and all that. And simply providing that, I think, equity piece in this larger uh, food security, um, food banking system is something that we're, was a, a really important learning. And then lastly, I'll say very quickly, I really love that Nicole is talking about all of the services that they're delivering and having um, access to food being one of those services because we quickly mobilized with our permanent supportive housing providers, DESC and Plymouth Housing, to provide nutritious um, prepared meals in those um, housing facilities. And what we learned was a great um, improvement in behavioral health outcomes for those individuals who are living in permanent supportive housing, not just reduction and prevention of COVID. So there were some um, benefits that we have learned. Um, and I think that really it's positioned the conversation, talk about how does healthy food stand alone as a service and, um, and a, a basic need, which we know it is, um, in the greater healing of trauma, um, physical health, ailments, et cetera. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a good question. You know, as I listen to you all, a question that comes to my mind, because I know that the, the pandemic has just exacerbated this situation um, of, of food security, but the question that comes to my mind is, with all the efforts that you've seen your organizations um, roll out, are there, are there still any gaps remaining that you're aware of? You know, are, are there any areas geographically within King County that you're still aware of that have not benefited from uh, the efforts? And I know this is kind of an impromptu question, um, but I, I'm curious because I know we're doing a great work. It just makes me wonder, 
Is it enough? Has it been enough? Who would like to respond? In? Gloria, from what you're seeing. Yeah. I guess I'll stick with the trend and I'll, I'll, I'll be drummer hop and lead things off. But um, I, one of the areas that, that's kind of a gap, um, I'm, I'm a partner with Issaquah Food and Clothing Bank. And so they've kind of got the Eastern Rim and then we're in the Southern tip of the city, but there are two areas there that um, sometimes just fall through the cracks and there are services available, but for some reason there are still people being missed and that is Renton and parts of Federal Way. And uh, we get requests all the time to do home delivery in places like Federal Way or in places like Renton, but it's just so far outside of the um, zone in, in terms of our being able to make that accessible or make it a route for one of our volunteers who may, might live in the city to uh, comfortably go and navigate and make those kinds of deliveries. So. We have ha found that there continues to be a bit of a wait list for services um, in those places. And we would really like to see if there's ways in which we can close those gaps and, and not have those, those problems persist. Yeah. I'd say in terms of materials, there's another uh, gap and that has to do with diapers um, and baby wipes and things like that, hygiene oh. products. Uh, people always think of the, the food items, but that they'll, thinking in terms of the whole person, you know, we really need to make sure that we are providing supplies uh, for the whole family, no matter what age they are. And at our drive through distribution, we run out of diapers every week. It's just crazy um, mm -hmm. the volume that we do for that type of product. Yeah, thank you, Gloria. Thank you so much. You know, I um, I know that there have been some high highs and probably some low lows uh, over the past year as you've been doing this amazing work. Um, can you share with us a little bit about some of the bright spots that uh, you've seen over the past year as you've been responding to this need? Um, Nicole? Yeah. That's a great question, thank you. Um, I think the partnerships and the innovation have been what have you know, made me excited when I get back to work to try and um, see how best we can support our communities. And I, I think a big piece of, of it that made me so excited is what we once thought was impossible. Suddenly we, we all came together and made it possible. And so, um, you know, that is what has been kind of that shining light for me as we've, you know, gone through what has been, seems like forever. Um, and the YMCA has had some really great partnerships, it, like with Fair Start, and then we have built some new ones, which has been amazing. And so um, we've deepened those partnerships with United Way, who had worked with us um, in kind of a thought partner type of uh relationship before, but then they were right alongside us serving meals. They were building systems with us for home delivery and making sure it was equitable and accessible. Um, and then King County Housing Authority, we created a new partnership with them. And now with Fair Start and United Way and King County Housing Authority, we're at 26 different locations serving seniors and families and youth meals. And so we really are breaking down those barriers to access and ensuring that communities don't have to travel to go find a meal, but that we can come to them much like what Gloria and her team are doing as well. So that has been a really um, great time. And I just want to share, if I can, a little, a little story that um, one of the seniors early on in the pandemic had uh, shared with us a little bit later and pulled me aside and when I was helping one day down um, here in Auburn um, and just said, you know, I wanna thank you for delivering the meals because your staff and volunteers were one of the few contacts that I had during this time. And I felt safe and it was a short amount of time, but I felt safe and it made me feel like someone was there and someone cared. And so um, I think just even those little interactions during this time has been truly amazing. Yeah, a lot of gratefulness, a lot of gratitude for work that's being done. Um, who would like to also share, Angela, some of the bright spots in the past year that you've experienced? Well, I think that, um, thank you, Nicole, for shining the light on some of those. I think that, you know, some of the brightest spots um, for us also came out of some of, you know, the darkest times. I think that what 
we saw with the double pandemic of COVID um, and uh, just really this, this continued reckoning around racial justice has given a fair start an opportunity to really look at who we want to be uh, going forward and how we want to show up in the community. And I know that everyone on this call is really excited to get uh, back to the Fair Start restaurant. We will open it just as soon as we can, um, as soon as the timing is right. But I think that what we have also seen is an opportunity for us to engage much more deeply um, in food equity and food justice access. Um, and so I think that um, part of that was just this reckoning and reality that what Gloria mentioned in, in Federal Way in South King County, um, which is where most of our diverse populations live, um, really has the most um, issue of access to food and that Fair Start has um, the opportunity to be a collaborator and a partner. Um, and we have a long history of doing this. So I really think that, that um, the highlight for us has been sort of this transformation um, and if you will, kind of a return to, to our, our roots around food security that, um, while well, again, we won't abandon that restaurant that you all love, we are looking to go more deeply. Um, and that, as a result, I think really feels good in um, changing, you know, who we are as, as a culture and as an organization. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to go off mute. You're going to see me disappear for a second because my cat is scratching at my office door. <laughs> Okay, Angela. Every other hey, this is real life, okay? Work from home. We love it. Gloria, um, tell us a little bit about some of the bright spots that you've seen. Oh, man, there have been many, many bright spots uh, to include. You know, we ha also have a partnership with Fair Start. They um, provide full uh, meals to us that go out to our backpack students. You know, that's a real help for uh, folks that are you know, need to put something nutrition, a square meal on the table, it's easy. If, if they have lots of obligations or are struggling because they are still trying to find a way to work uh, during the pandemic. So that's been a real help to us. Uh, we've also had some very surprising things happen. You know, a lot of uh, volunteers were afraid to continue to volunteer, uh, but where they could plug in and offer assistance, they did so. And one of the ways that that showed up is that um, if folks got furloughed uh, and they were highly skilled, they would look around for something to do to make a connection to uh, offer support to community. And one of those folks for us was an air traffic controller who um, had been volunteering, you know, doing some things online for us. And when we made the shift to all home delivery, he said, well, I can help you with that. You know, logistics, I know how to land a plane. I, I can get that car where it needs to go. So it was really a phenomenal deal that he, he found software for us. He helped us to design and develop all the routes that we needed for the program. Um, and it's things like that that make all the difference. Um, mm -hmm. I also wanted to mention that the volunteers who do still come and, and help us get this work done work very hard. And they oftentimes are elderly. And, and we had a gentleman who worked his volunteer shift and headed off to the bus stop to go home, and he collapsed. And a woman who had just moved into the shelter next door to the food bank was out, just happened by and, and found him and, and did CPR and was able to keep him uh, going until the um, aid unit could arrive and take him to the hospital where, where he is now fine, thriving, doing well. But all throughout the pan pandemic, all throughout this tough time, we've had stories like that happen where, you know, it's just that connection, just like Nicole was saying, that, that way in which people can still reach out and offer assistance and, and make a valuable addition to uh, make this, this all work for everybody. Yeah, that's awesome, amazing. I, if there's any good that could come out of this pandemic and the way that all the different agencies um, have come together is it would be the relationships that have been formed out of this crisis and that we would be able to look to the future with a new sense of hope and possibilities to continue to do this collaborative work because if we work together we can bring about the change we all want to see, yeah? And, and that's actually a, a segue to, to the next question I'd like to talk about, and that is the future, 
right? So we think about um, what's going to happen uh, at some point, hopefully, we're going to be out of this um, and we will experience a new normal in life. Uh, I don't think we're going to go back to life the way it was before COVID, uh, but there'll be a new normal. And so I wanted you to speak a little bit about what you think the future looks like uh, as we begin to imagine what the post-COVID world will be. And so as you consider your answer to these questions, um, think about it in the uh, context of hopes that you have, but also maybe challenges that you see may continue to, um, to face each of you. And with all challenges, if you flip them around, it's just an opportunity waiting to be had. So um, if you can talk a little bit about how we're going to turn those challenges into opportunities. So what does the future look like in this post-COVID world? Nicole, what are you thinking? Yeah, I uh, am right there with you, Julaine, with collaboration. I am um, so hopeful that our collaborations and our partnerships just continue to flourish as we rebuild together. Um, because what we may be doing right now may not work in three months or six months. Um, and I just really hope that uh, we continue to do that partnership work, that thoughtful community um, work, and really look to work with our communities and uniquely meet their needs in innovative ways um, because each of our communities are so unique and beautiful. And it's been just really wonderful to see the different ways that we've kind of filled in gaps and supported each other um, that specifically meet that community's needs. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. Um, I'm excited about potentially doing some more programming with kiddos again, uh, you know, and really helping to um, identify how we best support our kids as they come back to a world that is different, as they've experienced so much trauma, um, and kind of navigating what that looks like moving forward. And to, um, I think, everybody's point that we've been talking about, that whole person health. Um, so how do we provide access for our families and our kids um, with healthy, nutritious food, but also what are those other supports that we can come together to also provide to ensure that our communities are um, ready to flourish and thrive. Um, so that is what I am really excited about. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. We are all hoping that this is gonna be our future. Um, hopes and challenges and opportunities, ladies. What are you thinking? Angela, what's on your heart? What's on your mind? Well, I think, you know, I, I do, um, really think that what we've seen, not just in, in organizations like the, the three that are here, but, you know, really beyond in, in Western Washington, we have seen so much collaboration happen in ways that I don't think that we have seen before. And so my hope is that the whole social service sector will continue to work together very closely, um, that we will have a lot more alignment um, with our business and, um, and provider communities. But I think for Fair Start, you know, one thing that we really learned, and, and I think you've heard a lot of that community-centered and individual-centered um, feedback and, and direction, you know, and really answering the call of what the communities need and want and what's appropriate for them, which may not always be um, what is front of mind um, for, for organizations. So, for example, um, for, as far as Fair Start is concerned, you know, we're really looking at um, bringing back our students in person, but in, in the meantime, really valuing the training and transferable skill training that we're giving uh, virtually. But as we bring programming and job training back, um, what is, what's a more individual, um, uh, an individualized focus uh, that we can apply to our program so that we can meet community needs and meet students where they are? Um, I think that as far as um, looking at food security, um, it to Gloria's point, um, I think Nicole made it as well, we're going to be in this for a really long time. Um, again, looking at where prepared meals fall into that space and really um, looking at the entire food system and finding ways that we can continue to innovate to break down those barriers, to um, lessen the inequities. I think, you know, challenges that we have um, there is a lot of big systemic change that needs to happen, and that's really hard. Um, so this isn't just um, this isn't just a food problem. This is a race equity problem. This is a food apartheid issue. 
Um, and this is something that's really going to take big systemic change from employers, from the government, from food system, um, from providers. And so that is, that is not an, an easy task to undertake. But I think that what we have learned and the humanity that has come out of the last year has a lot more people at the table and a lot, um, a lot more uh, determination to come back better and come back in a different way and come back more equitably. So that's, that's, those are sort of my hopes and, and yeah. challenges that I see. Yeah, thanks, Angela. Um, Gloria, I want to give you an opportunity also to share with us what you see as, as some of your hopes and also any challenges that may accompany those hopes as we go into this post-COVID world. Well, I have very big hopes and they all dovetail with uh, what Angela just said in regards to two things, um, the issues of, of equity relative to food and access to food, and also the willingness of partners that are non-traditional partners in this work. So companies and I, I see my friend Liz is on the call, even um, uh, in institutions such as S uh, Seattle Public Utilities, all, all folks that you wouldn't necessarily think of as partners in this work, but they are. Because mm -hmm. what we want to be able to do is to create a sustainable system for people to be able to access food um, according to their own needs, uh, what their families need, uh, and on the time schedule for when they need that food. And I, I have a dream that we're going to be able to create a system that identifies where food is coming into an area and then move that food where it needs to go uh, according to its expiration so that it that we stop wasting so much food, uh, that we put more food to purpose, that we make food more easily accessible, and that we also think in terms of, of not having uh, siloed organizations doing this work, but something uh, akin to what you're seeing on this uh, webinar today where we're in partnership with one another. We're, in, in, we're doing this work together. We all have shared goals. We share with one another. We resource with one another um, to make sure that we're having the desired uh, impact and breaking down those barriers to people being able to have equity and access to their food. So um, I have uh, lofty, lofty goals and lofty, lofty dreams. Uh, the challenge is that not everyone is of like mind. And it, it can be, um, you know, the nonprofit sector is sort of constructed to be in competition, and that, that I think is just really unfair, uh, that we are challenged to do fundraising in the way that we are, sometimes means that we are more protective than, than we should be if we really wanted to be, build deep, broad systems that are collaborative. Um, so one of the challenges I think that we need to overcome, that I think this pandemic has led us to, frankly, is the need for us to not compete with one another and to be more in league with one another. And I, I love that these partnerships have started to emerge. And um, so I'm gonna shift this again to an opportunity, just like you said, Jelaine, and say, it's an opportunity that we can build on, on, on the successes that we've had so far. And this can get, continue to strengthen and grow. And you know, five years from now, uh, look out, because it's gonna be an amazing place to be. Uh, we're gonna show uh, the country, just what can happen when when people like us do come together in this work. Okay, I'm just gonna say amen to that. Okay, Gloria, yes, yes, and I love the idea about us being able to be unified around a common purpose for a common good. Um, and then we are aware of the realities of challenges, right? And every sector uh, has its own in terms of um, competition and, and response to that, right? Um, but I'm curious about, um, are, there, are there ways that the community itself can actually support you going forward? Um, as we've talked about your hopes, we've talked about uh, also your, your challenges uh, and opportunities that come along with, what can the community do to help to move forward uh, the, um, the continuing efforts to work together and to also to fill some of the gaps that haven't yet been filled, right? So how can we support you in, in, this, in this work and this effort? Nicole? Um, uh, let's start with you. Let's, what are your thoughts around how the community can support going forward? 
Yeah. Um, so I think communities can support by accessing the programs when they need them. And uh, a big piece of that is giving us feedback about what they see as the needs in their community, um, what needs to be changed to better meet their needs. I think that's a huge piece of um, just ensuring that we're working with our communities and, and taking that feedback and making changes as needed. Um, and then if folks can, you know, Gloria was talking about donating time, you know, if you have the ability to help us, you know, come help us, um, help serve meals to different uh, communities, wherever that may be, or whatever feels the most safe for you right now, um, whether that's doing some paperwork to help out a little bit or serving meals, um, donating your time is a huge piece. Um, and then if you have the ability at all, donating dollars to help support these programs, um, you know, talking to, or uh, with Gloria talking about, let's not compete. We've had a big saying uh, nationally with our wise of let's, let's not compete, but let's complete our communities. And so how do we really look at the funding that's out there and, and um, you know, just make sure that together we rebuild. Um, and so if there are opportunities for folks to give dollars, I encourage you to give it to um, the folks on this call today or whomever you feel the most passionate about to help solve these problems coming to our communities. Um, and then again, I'm just going to repeat that the need is not going to recede um, as we get vaccinated. And so I think, you know, I, while I am super hopeful, as hopefully you've seen on this call today, um, you know, I, I think a lot of uh, words that I've been hearing is, you know, once we get vaccinated, things will change, and it will. Some things may change, but the uh, food insecurity rates are not going to suddenly go away. Um, and so even if you can't do something today, if you can do something three months from now, six months from now, you know, I think whatever you can do to help us rebuild will be amazing. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. Um... Gloria and Angela, same question. Uh, anything you will add to what Nicole has already shared? Okay, I'm gonna be a good no. I'm gonna be a good. I'm gonna be a good host and let you let you yeah. go first, Gloria. Yeah, Gloria. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, thank you so much for that, Nicole. Um, I would only add that we have a tremendous opportunity to hear from community members about how what their needs are and how they best want to solve their issues. And I think that as we continue forward in this work and as the um, effects of the pandemic persist uh, for um, the elongated time that we are forecasting, that that's going to be really, really important. And we're going to learn new things. And that's how we get to innovation, true innovation, because I think they, that the community has the best ideas. And I, I, so I'm going to, one of the things that I'm going to ask of my, my peers on the call is that, you know, we work together to create pathways for uh, listening sessions to hear from folks. I'm trying to impress upon policymakers at the city level, too, that we should start by hearing from people before we enact um, policy decisions that are going to have an influence or an effect on people's ability, ability to build resilience in their lives. I, I think that that's going to be critically important. I think that that's going to be a shift that you're going to see more and more in terms of how people talk about social services, social fabric. It, uh, it's going to be a whole new model, hearing from folks in the community about the best ways to serve them, the best ways to reach them, uh, what their needs truly are in, in this regard. And it's, I'm, I'm very, very excited about that opportunity. Mm, thank you, Gloria. Angela, what would you add? Well, I think I would button it up by, um, you know, just just defining um, community and, and just asking this group, you know, our wonderful donor community, partner community, to understand that as we shift to more equity, that we're talking about um, communities who um, have this lived experience, who have the need, who are our service, um, who, are the, who are the clients who, in which we are in service to, um, and, and walk along the journey with us as we evolve in our organizations to become more equitable, to become more just, and that, um, that you, you just stay on this path with, us, path with us and hold us accountable to um, the communities that we serve, hold us accountable to partnerships with one another, um, and continue to give your dollars 
um, to the organizations on this call and others as we evolve into um, who we will, who, who we need to be and how we need to show up in the communities in a post COVID world, which is also a world again that, that you know, COVID was a big piece of last year, but so was this, you know, a real reckoning around race equity and, and justice and injustice. Mm -hmm. And what does it mean for us as organizations to start um, correcting some of the injustices? And I think that um, the folks on this call have an opportunity to do that around food justice, around um, economic mobility um, and upward mobility. So um, it's a journey. And I think that, that nonprofits and service providers are going to be on um, a journey that may be a little bit different than you expect, that may be a little bit uncomfortable, um, that may be recentered um, in a direction that, um, that, that you wouldn't think of. Um, and I, I think about Fair Start in that is that, you know, again, we are really excited to, to someday bring back the, the Fair Start restaurant, but we are really, really excited to be part of a big systems change around racial um, equity and food justice. So um, I'll stop with that. Well, thank you so much for calling that out, Angela, because it all does go together. I mean, you really cannot address the issue of food security and ignore the issues of justice um, that also are contributing systemically to the issue to begin with. So I thank you for calling that out. I thank each and every one of you for responding to my questions. And um, we also have some questions from our participants in the call today. So I wanted to also spend some time before we wrap things up uh, addressing uh, those questions. And the first one is one of the participants is asking what innovations our panelists, are you panelists seeing, not just locally, uh, but I guess they're asking in a broader sense, even nationally, in increasing food security. So what innovations are you seeing, not just locally, in increasing food security? Someone like to uh, respond to that panelist question or that participant's question. Well, I'll, I'll tee up a couple. Uh, you know, I think that the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which is commonly known as SNAP, or uh, what used to be called food stamps, one of the things that they've done is create a uh, means of, of using a payment on a debit card. Um, so that as you are using your benefit, you just go through the checkout at a grocery store, just like any, but any other patron would. It's not stigmatizing because no one knows uh, that your method of payment is anything different than theirs. And I think uh, where we can start to drive stigma out of the social service pipeline or process is always a good thing. And so I envision a time when food banks can use a similar type of mechanism where we can maybe make uh, credits available in partnership with some of our, our donor classes where we can build a quorum of support and then reload cards so that folks can shop uh, with dignity for the food items that they need, maybe to supplement what they're able to get from a food bank, for example. Uh, I mentioned diapers before, that that might be an example where we could supplement uh, their, their income or their ability to make purchases through um, the grocery store outlets or chains. Um, another uh, innovation um, that is uh, just hasn't really caught hold uh, yet here, but some folks are, are starting to look at it and it's mobile markets. Um, driving marketing out to community groups or areas and letting folks shop for themselves right in their own community. Um, and so that's one of the things that Rainier Valley Food Bank is exploring. Uh, you know, this pandemic has exposed a need to have a lot of flexibility and a lot of options in terms of how we drive food out into the market, out into the community. Um, and so that's another innovation that we're considering that I think uh, will bear a lot of fruit. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just gonna tack onto this and say, Gloria, we need to get on a call like right after this um, because Fair Start is uh, working to um, pilot a focus group for a mobile market where we can partner with our food pantries, where we can take our prepared meals and we can go to the food apartheid areas. Um, and I think to, to your point, Gloria, have these mobile markets reach um, parts of our county and parts of our region um, in a way that's very community-based and community-centered and welcoming and 
celebratory um, rather than stigmatizing and whether that's um, the ability to use SNAP benefits on the mobile market. Um, but I will tell you, we are so excited about this mobile market pilot um, program. And we are definitely, um, we've been, we have certainly uh, are excited to bring some partners in on this. So um, if, if you had, you and I will, will be on it now. Cause I know yeah, you're on yeah. the same path. You see me, see me doing the happy dance, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, I think the other innovative that I would just add, and again, more ways of partnership is the work that we are doing uh, currently with Rainier Valley Food Bank. Um, and that we've been doing with Seattle Public Schools and that Fair Start has a really important role that we can play in getting prepared frozen meals uh, into, um, food banks, um, pa local pantries, possibly into locations like the Y, where families can have an opportunity to get fresh scratch made meals that are easy for them to access, easy to heat, and again, bring a little bit of, of joy and, and just ease their, you know, for those who are unable to prepare foods or just need a break from cooking, that that yeah. shouldn't be something that you get to do only if you make a certain amount of money. So um, I think that that's been one innovative thing that we've already started. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm so excited to see what happens when like-minded people get together and start <laughs> sharing what they're envisioning. Oh my goodness. Actually, one of our participants asked a question and it sort of relates to this idea of uh, the mobile market. But the question is, what practices in meal delivery or repurposing surplus food and partnerships do you want to continue in the post-COVID world um, or as we come out of COVID? In other words, what do we want to stick? What do we want to continue to see as it pertains to meal delivery and repurposing of surplus food? Someone like to take that one? I can Nicole? go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, thank you, jump um, right yeah. in. Yeah, I would like to see um, the um, kind of going beyond outside of our walls. So similar to the mobile kind of markets and things like that, I'd like to see us continue to um, going to where folks live and um, or parks and things like that to provide some services and build community in that way. And then, um, you know, I think another, another piece as we kind of move forward is um, providing some, um, different ways for us to connect and different ways for us to think about community as we come together. And so um, a little bit with the, you know, similar to the mobile markets and, and things like that, just providing some different ways for our communities to connect. Excellent. And can I just say, Nicole, you guys have been doing such a good job at that for so long with the summer meals programs um, and going into um, local neighborhood parks um, and really bringing not only, you know, kids together, but um, I think family and community together. So shout out to, to you for doing that for a long time already. Yeah. Gloria. And I would, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would really like to, I, I would really like to see some of the uh, partnerships that have emerged through this process continue. Um, I think that uh, one of the things that would be helpful to do is to partner around identifying where those gaps are, because then when we start bringing um, innovations online, like a mobile market, you know, we can target specifically those gap areas first to go after. And I'm just going to make a huge assumption that Fair Start's all over that already, <laughs> but I, you know, I'm just kind of putting it out into the space as well. Um, but it, but it is a way in which we can continue to knit together these collaborative efforts around uh, solving this problem, and having good uh, sources of data. And you know, someone had asked, or Nicole had mentioned ways in which you can get involved and, and be supportive of this work. And if that's an area of skill or expertise that you have around crunching numbers and gathering data and synthesizing it so that it, it tells a story about what's going on with the uh, an issue in a specific area, that, that that's a really useful and helpful uh, skill that a lot of nonprofits don't have the capacity to to um, to um, put into practice for themselves. So that, that's an, a real area that we could use support in, uh, just by way of example. Yeah, thank you, Gloria. Um, anything else before we kind of start wrapping things up? Those were the last questions from our participants. Um, I just want to make sure that you've all had a chance to share 
what you would like to um, have the participants know about the way that they can support and also anything that you would want to see continue happening as we move into this new reality post-COVID. All right. I just want I just want to say thank you so much, you know, to these wonderful fellow panelists, not just for today, but I mean, I think that I'm leaving feeling really energized about the work that we can can can, can continue to, to do collaboratively. And I think to just tack on to, to Gloria's point, there are so many inefficiencies that we can cut through when we work together and we can, you know, partner to centralize more things, we can find those gaps. Um, and so I think that really we can, you know, it sounds like it, it sounds like a cliche, but we can be better at this when we do it together. Um, and so there are so many, you know, if you can think of other organizations um, um, taking Gloria's point a little bit further that would, that would benefit from this work with us. I know we are talking to Seattle Public Utilities, uh, of Meals Partner Co Co Meals Partnership Coalition members, you know, uh, Northwest Harvest, Food Lifeline, other food banks, um, you know, uh, the other Y programs. Like, this is how we all, like, we all need to be connected to one another um, to make our community better. So. That's right. That is so true. Um, as we uh, wrap this up, I want to personally thank you guys for entrusting me with the responsibility to moderate the discussion today and for each of your leadership um, in your respective organizations. I just applaud you uh, for stepping up and responding to the call to do something and to do it with thoughtfulness and intention and purpose. Um, and for all of you who have been on the call with us today, thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your day to uh, join us today. And I, I want to just hearken back to something that was said earlier. Uh, I think Angela mentioned it, but I think we all can uh, agree that when we talk about community and we define who community is, that we don't just think about community in terms of those who we're serving, but we also talk about it in terms of those who are serving. In other words, the servers as well as those being served. In other words, it's all of us. And and collectively, we can do things to support the organizations, the nonprofits that are stepping up to respond to the need for food security. And some of the ideas I want to leave you with that were mentioned during this panel today are number one, if you are in the community and you need the service, then avail yourself of the service and make that known. In other words, access these programs that are available to you. They're here for you. So do not be shy about stepping up and saying, I need help because we're all here to help each other. And then the other thing that I heard say to, uh, said today is give us your feedback. None of us has the answer to all of the needs and or understanding of how to do it well. So speak to the leaders of the organizations and let them know what you think. And they are ready and willing to listen. And that I think too is a message to the community that we have to listen to one another. And so I am encouraging you to also give your feedback. And then if you're a service provider to listen to those you are serving. And then for those of you who are able to donate your time as well as your finances, please volunteer your time and also give. And speaking of giving, you can donate to uh, the organizations that are represented here on this uh, panel uh, during Give Big, which is an initiative that is going to be starting on May the 4th and the 5th. It's the state of Washington's biggest annual fundraising event. So mark your calendar. May 4th and May 5th, and better yet, go to givebigwa.org. That's givebigwa.org and schedule your donation today and just participate in this opportunity to give. And then the last thing I'll say before I wrap up is that we have to remember that none of this work will be sustainable long-term if we do not address the issue of justice and the need for race equity. We have to respond to the root causes that create the, the need for food um, security because food insecurity is in our communities. And so I just encourage all of you to just be aware of what can you do to help to uh, spread justice in the lives of all people because we are all 
our brothers and sisters. We are interconnected and we are interdependent one on the other. So having said all that, that's all I have to say. Uh, we're going to be doing a couple more of these events and I hope to see you back again in the future. Thank you all. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Angela. I applaud each and every one of you. Love you, ladies, and for all that you do. Thank you to all the participants for uh, being here with us today. Bye-bye.